All right. So good evening, everybody. My name is Ani Gellis. I'm the Community Programs Manager at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. I am delighted to welcome you all this evening for this program, um, talking about women of steel in Baltimore and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. For those not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we're located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We are dedicated to telling the stories of workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. We are currently in the third year of our Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project, which seeks to preserve the 125 year history of the steelmaking giant here in Baltimore. Uh, I wanted to tell you about a few portions of that project, one of which is an outdoor exhibit about women working in the steel industry called Women of Steel. Um, this is on our fence along Key Highway and it's open 24 seven. It will likely be up through the end of October and possibly later than that, depending on how the weather treats it. Um, so you're invited to come take a look if you haven't seen it already. And we also have a podcast called Sparrows Point, an American Steel Story. That's a six part series. And um, one of the episodes features Kathy and other women of steel talking about their experiences. So I'll share a link for that in the chat as well. Um, and finally, we have a new exhibit. It'll be a long-term exhibition at the BMI called Fire and Shadow that is opening very soon. Um, the first day it'll be open to the public is September 25th, um, but that should be up for at least a number of years. So if you're local to Baltimore, we hope to see you uh, soon. And if you're in Bethlehem or other uh, parts of the country, maybe you can make it um, when things open back up a little bit more. Programs like this are made possible um, thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you are currently a member or a supporter, thank you very much. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I will encourage you to check out our website and I'll share a link in the chat. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as you all know, with a Zoom webinar, uh, your, the participants' cameras are turned off and your mic uh, but we really would love to hear your questions. And if you have your own experiences to share, please do use the chat and um, let us know what you're thinking about. Um, and this is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube probably tomorrow. So look for that. And if you're interested in watching it again or sharing it with a friend, I would now like to turn the floor over to Julia Masurgian, who is the digital scholarship team manager at the Lehigh University Library in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Over to you, Julia. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. I'll take a moment that is, I always call it that awkward moment of screen sharing um, where everything kind of stands still for a moment. Um, I'm asking if folks can see my screen. Thumbs up from my presenters. Great. Perfect. I'm delighted to join you uh, this evening to, to give a very, very brief introduction of our project, uh, Women of Bethlehem Steel. Um, we, it, the genesis of the project was in 2016. I, uh, myself and another colleague from Lehigh met with Jill Shinnam of the Steelworkers Archives, and you'll meet in just a moment, uh, to really talk about what's really missing in the Bethlehem Steel story from the Bethlehem plant and offices. And um, unanimously, we decided that women were underrepresented and particularly not necessarily just that nothing had been done about women, but, it, but disseminating information about women to a larger audience was missing. So we uh, got together, my colleagues in the digital scholarship team uh, at, with the Steelworkers Archives and we applied for a Mellon Digital Humanities Initiative. Um, this was a Mellon grant that was given to Lehigh University and our grant, the Lehigh's grant was to uh, do collaborative work, particularly with uh, people and institutions um, around Bethlehem. So we applied for a grant and we were funded uh, and gratefully it, uh, the funding actually allowed us to um, curate uh, existing collections from both the Steelworkers Archives and Lehigh University uh, and to generate new information uh, to be um, presented on the web. Then later we received some, we always have to give uh, 
credit where credit's due. Uh, later, we received uh, some additional funding from Lehigh Southside Initiative because it was just a grant year, a really ambitious grant year, and we had a little extra work to do toward the end, and so Southside Initiative funded us. I'm hoping that things proceed nicely. I've been having a little problem with my PowerPoint. It's not advancing. So I may need to bail and hmm, I will. Let me get out of here and pull up my PDF. I've had way, way too many um, problems with technology to know that it always works beautifully. So I'm going to put up. And again, I'm going to ask for a thumbs up from the presenters to let me know. Okay, great. Perfect. So we, um, we decided that we would take um, not only the experiences of women who worked in, at Bethlehem Steel at, on the plant and the plant and in the offices, but also those who have strong familial uh, affiliations uh, with the steel. And, and also um, worked with, with business industry things, family businesses as well that worked with steel and steel workers, particularly on our south side of Bethlehem. Uh, we thought the best way to do this was to have a collection which was housed in a much larger collection called Beyond Steel, an archive of Lehigh Valley industry and culture. So uh, this grant helped us pay for uh, digitizing transcripts and, um, and indexing of oral histories. So of this entire collection, we have uh, 78 items, many photographs um, and audio and video um, interviews. And of these 78 items, I consider these 35 um, interviews of the women of Bethlehem Steel to be our crown jewels of the collection because you get that firsthand account of what it was like to work at Bethlehem Steel in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I always have to say that because we're, we're representing two different places. So these interviews, some of them, like I said, were curated from existing collections, one of which actually was recorded in 1975 and actually reflects, reflects uh, narrators who were born at the, the beginning of the 20th century and up through our more current interviews for people that we've done in 2016 and 2017. And in fact, Jill and I are hoping to add even more in, in the months to come, at least a couple of more interviews. So what does one of these um, oral histories look like? This um, is an example. Uh, this is Esther Lee. Esther worked as a clerk in a Bethlehem Still office, the first African-American hire in the office. She worked from 1960 to 1969 uh, at Bethlehem Steel. She speaks of racism uh, that she experienced um, while working uh, at Bethlehem Steel as where I'm quite sure she would be experiencing that anywhere uh, from 1960 to 1969. This is not just a purview of the South, that's for sure. And um, she also uh, talks about, although this was past her time at Bethlehem Steel, but I found it extremely interesting that she talks a lot about the 1974 consent decree and what it did to aid in minority hires and women hiring. Um, so this gives you an idea of what these oral histories look like. So you can view the entire video or audio. You can look at the indexes that are to your left. You can switch over and look at the entire transcript. And you can also search the indexes by keyword or phrases and, and whatever that you, um, whatever you might be looking for. So that gives you a very, very brief idea of so what's there. I hope, I hope, oh, and I totally forgot to tell you this. Um, this web address, don't worry about writing it down. If you do a search on, in Google for Beyond Steel, it will be one of the first three results that come up. 
So that makes it really easy. You don't have to do the HTTPS or what it, whatever uh, to, to be able to get to it. Please feel free to contact me. I hope you'll plug around the site. Let me know what you think and um, give any suggestions or comments that you might have. We'd love to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. All right, now I would like to introduce this evening's moderator, Jill Shenham. Jill is the Chair of Anthropology, Sociology, and Economics at the County College of Morris in Randolph, New Jersey. She researches economic disparities resulting from the loss of union jobs, and her forthcoming book examines the effect that Bethlehem Steel's bankruptcy had on steelworkers' lives. All right, with that, I'll turn it away. Okay. Well, great, thank you very much. So we are here today. I, first of all, I wanna say that um, that Lehigh University project and like putting some of these oral histories on record is incredibly important. The Steelworkers Archives does sponsor an essay contest in the Bethlehem Public Schools. And we're already seeing that a lot of the essays are going to the Beyond Steel website and are looking at some of these interviews with women that are really important stories that haven't um, really been a part of like the public record until now. And we're really, really lucky tonight to have two of these pioneering women with us to talk to us about working in the steel mills, both in Bethlehem and uh, of course in here in Baltimore at Sparrows Point. Um, and, um, you know, it's really important to hear the voices of women who were doing that in the 1970s when they were, in Bethlehem's case, the first women on the shop floor since World War II. In Baltimore's case, some of the first women on the shop floor. There was a, a tin mill that had had women in it after World War II uh, for quite a while in, in Baltimore. So the historical background is just that as a result of the civil rights and women's movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Equal Pay for Women Act of 1963, uh, and then uh, the 1974 consent decree, which was a, um, a deal worked out between Bethlehem Steel and eight other steel companies, the United Steel Workers Union and the government, the EEOC, which resolved some race-based discrimination cases that had originated out of Bethlehem Steel's Sparrows Point plant and Bethlehem Steel's Lackawanna plant. Um, the 1974 consent decree became literally one of the most extensive affirmative action plans in basic industry up to that point. And what it did was it um, did a number of different things, but it, um, you know, um, created plant-wide seniority so that people could move use their seniority to move out of departments into other departments. Uh, racism within the plants had limited workers to certain departments within the plants. It also um, mandated some quotas for hiring, which employ, uh, you know, applied to minority workers and applied to women. And there was also a, a, like a back pay component. So as a result of the consent decree, uh, jobs on the shop floor in the plant became available to women for the first time in, in many instances since World War II. So, you know, the, the women we have here today, Honey Jean Honey Brueger and from the Bethlehem plant and Kathy Garrison from the Sparrows Point plant started working on the shop floors in the Bethlehem plant and Sparrows Point in the 1970s at a time when the shop floor and the steel mill culture was really a man's world. Um, so, you know, I want to introduce both of them and then we'll, um, so, so Jean Honey Brueger worked with Bethlehem Steel from 1964 through 1993. Um, she came from a steel working family in which her great grandfather, her grandfather, her father, her aunts and uncles and her sisters and brothers all worked at the Bethlehem plant. And her family, like many in the city of Bethlehem, had some members who worked in management and some who were union members on the shop floor. She started on the shop floor in 1974 before the consent decree was enacted. She was the very first woman to go onto the Bethlehem 
Pennsylvania shop floor since World War II. And the Bethlehem plant then hired 50 women in 1975 after the consent decree. And 1979 was also, also a big year for hiring. And Jean Brueger was very involved with working with those women. We have Kathy Garrison, who grew up in a steelworking family and steelworking community of um, Edgemere. Uh, which many of you know. Uh, her mother worked for Bethlehem Steel's main office. Her husband worked in the tin mill and she started at Sparrows Point in 1976 and worked there until th 2012. And um, Kathy was also instrumental in starting the United Steel Workers Women of Steel program in Sparrows Point in 2004, which was a very important union program for, for women and continued to be until the closing of the plant. So those are my introductions and the background, and I'd really like to turn it over to them. So I wondered if the both of you could start out by talking about why you decided to apply for and take a job on the shop floor in the mill. And in the 1970s, what did your friends and family think about that when that wasn't really something women were doing, you know, moving into and working into industrial jobs, especially a steel mill job. So Kathy or Honey, who, whoever would like to start out. I'll start, this is Honey. You can go ahead, Honey. Oh, okay, sorry. I am. Um... I actually started February 5th, 1973, in industrial plant. I was working at the time in accounts payable, and um, the girl who was in charge of salary employment knew me well and called me and said, this job's opening up, and we wanted to offer it to you. So I went over and got tested and said I'd take it because it was way more money for me. And um, at the time, I was divorced and had a daughter. And I said, great. Went down. We had somewhat of a problem getting shoes for me because there were no women's work shoes in our area and um, I ended up wearing um, a man's work shoe with a steel tip with like four pairs of socks and uh, went out to number two machine shop which did all the large rolls that then went on to be processed and used by the Navy on ships for guns. So it was a huge shop. And uh, the day I got there, the main office people brought me down and said to this office in general, this is your new hire, what my name was. And the supervisor sat in the back of the room and he had like a partition. He stood up and he looked and he said, I don't want an effing girl. So for the first week, no one talked to me. I went in every day, sat in a chair at a desk, nothing to do, no work, no matter who I said something to, you know, do you want to give me, I could file, I could do what would not talk to me, would give me no work. The next week I was scheduled night shift and I was fortunate enough to had someone sensible who went out with me on night shift and showed me the way around the shop and what the job entailed, which I had a pretty good idea of what it, what it was about, but I, I didn't know all the particulars. And he and uh, the first night was just horrendous. People just wouldn't take the slips that I wrote what the job was going to cost or anything. They just threw them back and screamed and yelled that they weren't going to take my prices. And it was quite 
disturbing to me. Some of the things they said were really crude, rude, obnoxious. But I just thought, well, that's their problem. Well, then, after the first week of night shift, I went into middle shift, and I thought, well, maybe it won't be so bad. Well, it was worse. They knew I was coming. They filled my shoes with the oil. They, uh, I had put a lunch in the refrigerator. They filled it with X lax. Uh, I couldn't set a drink down anywhere because I couldn't trust that I could drink it. So I just stopped bringing any kind of lunch and just would go to the water fountain and take a drink of water in my shift. And it was, it, there was nowhere to go to the bathroom whatsoever. And as I moved through shops that, Filling in for vacation, setting rates everywhere. There was no bathroom for girls. And yet, the superintendents had their own private bathrooms in the offices and offices that their clerks did the paperwork for that job had a bathroom. I would ask them, watch the door. They wouldn't. They'd say, go ahead, go in, and then they'd come in. It it was so foreign to me, is all I can explain it, that there were a lot of people. Bethlehem's not that big of a city. I knew a lot of the people. I couldn't believe they were acting like this. They they knew our whole whole relation is pretty big. And my father himself was involved in so many things. It, there were lots and lots of guys who worked there who knew my father. Church, boys club, different, every different sport. He, he coached, he raised money. I mean, there isn't anybody who didn't know him just about in town. So it was very odd to me that they knew who I was and were like that to me even though they had always been nice on the outside. So I just thought, well, this is the way it is and this is the way it is. And there were a lot of really ridiculous statements. I took a man's job. Uh, Girls can't do masks. And it, it, at times, I kept thinking to myself, is it all worth it? But it was worth it because I needed to earn the more money. So, okay, Kathy, over to you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so Kathy, so, you know, honey, it's really interesting. You're describing at the Bethlehem plant an entire, you know, company that really, and workers that really seemed unprepared for women to come in, even though this consent decree had been passed, you described not having bathrooms, workers being very hostile to women coming in, not having any kind of preparation or training uh, for workers, for women to come in. So Kathy, I wonder what went on at the Baltimore plant. And I'll go back sort of to my first question, like what did your family, um, like think about you even getting a job in the plant in the 1970s, and then you can move into what was it like when you actually started working there? Well, I was already married and I had an eight month old, but in our neighborhood, and I guess, I don't know um, whether all neighborhoods in America were like that, but we were a steel making community and stuff like that. And they were very defined, you know, the husband was the homemaker. I mean, the ho- husband was a breadwinner and the mom was the homemaker. And for the most part, you know, since I was already married, my husband didn't really like the idea of me going to work. He said, it's embarrassing that a man's wife should have to work. It means he can't support his family. And, you know, so it was very, very common all up and down the streets of the neighborhood where I lived at, where, you know, the women, the women took care of the kids in the house and you know, that was, that was, everybody had to find jobs and dad was the, the, you know, 
got his lunchbox, went out, made the money and come home. And um, so when I, but my mother was a widow because my father died in the service when I was a baby. So, um, but she worked in the main office. She had started there right out of high school. And um, she, did, she never worked in the mill, but she worked, you know, in key punch is what she did. And so I always, I had that example of not necessarily having the homemaker mom. My mom was a working mom. So to me, when I got married and, and had a child and everything like that, it didn't occur to me that I wasn't supposed to work, <laughs> you know, that, I, that it was, you know, so I, I kind of, to be honest with you, um, wanted to work. I wanted to, my husband worked in the mill and, you know, it, there was a lot of layoffs at that time back then, you know, you would get laid off and then you would get called back and it was like a feast or famine sort of thing. And um, I wanted to be able to buy a home and everything quicker and be able to have, the, you know, I guess I wanted to kind of, I was a little more impatient. I wanted, we were young, married couple, you know, and I, my mother had come home from work one day and she said they're hiring at the plant and they're going to hire women. And I said, oh, I could go down there and work. And, you know, my husband, he said, well, I don't really want you to work. I, you know, you just stay, stay home and take care of the baby. And, but I wanted to work. I wanted to help. I wanted to, you know, for us to be able to accomplish things and, and, uh, you know, have, have, be able to buy a home and that sort of thing. So my brother had just graduated high school. So I came down and put an application in with him. And back at that time when they hired, they mass hired, you know, there was a line that stretched all the way around the building because it was a good chance at a, at a, at a, at a slice of the American pie. I mean, just a, a probably never be a millionaire, but you'll have a nice, you know, a nice opportunity to have a, a, a home, a buy a home and have, you know, a second car and stuff like that. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I said, well, I want to go try it. So I went down with my brother and I put the application in and um, more on a dare than anything, to be honest with you. I wasn't looking for a job at that time. I mean, I did it just because they said, oh, you could never work down there. And I said, yeah, I could. I think I could do it. Um, so I put the application in along with my brother. We stood in line. It seemed like all day long, there were hundreds of people in line. And um, I got a, a, um, a letter in the mail, like a week later, telling me to come down for the physical and, and to take the test. And I was like, oh goodness, now, now what do I do? And you know, I, I kind of like, I had a discussion with my husband and he said, well, I really don't, don't want you to work, but you know, I said, we could buy a house so much quicker and, and everything and kind of talked him into it. And uh, he says, all right, well, you know, you know, it's awful hot and it's awful dangerous down there. And, and so I went, took the test and it, it was, the hiring process was pretty quick. Um, then they told me, um, I took the physical and then they said, you'd be starting in the open hearth, right? Number four open hearth. And I come home, I didn't know what an open hearth was. I didn't know what any of it was. I just knew that I heard all the sounds because I grew up listening to the train whistles and the, you know, the booms and the bangs. I didn't know what a crane operator was or any of those things or what an open hearth was. So I came home and I told my husband that I was going into the open hearth and he was like, oh my God, oh no, that's horrible. That's hot and it's so dangerous. And he said, I don't want you working there. And I said, I'll, you know, I'll be fine. I just, you know, and uh, so really it didn't start out as, uh, it, I wasn't, I mean, it's funny because they say, well, we were pioneers and stuff. We didn't know we were pioneers. We were just trying to do what we had to do to get by and have, you know, have a decent life. I mean, I didn't set out to be any kind of a rebel or anything like that. That's another thing that was funny. A lot of the guys in, in when I first started there, they automatically, because this was a time, you got to remember, this was a time of um, women's lib and women's rights and women were burning their bras and that sort of stuff, you know? And, um, you know, it was a time when um, 
there was a lot of upheaval as far as women women went and so they automatically thought that you were a women's liver and that you you know that you hated all men and that sort of thing you know but um you know, I used to tell them I, I, I'm a mom I bake cookies I'm, I'm just trying to you know make a better life for my family I'm trying to help my husband out I and ironically now you think about there's very few families that can afford just to have one person work just about everybody's now it takes two people to work and and um you know i just uh and we did you know we ended up by being able to buy a house and everything like that but but it was more like a challenge you know yeah and you know kathy i think that people don't realize maybe this is from bethlehem but i'm sure it's from Baltimore also the real wage differences between the work that was available for women in Bethlehem in textile factories or in retail work and the pay that women could get in the 1970s going to the steel mill. And I've had so many women say when they got their first paycheck, the difference they saw was just incredible. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what minimum wage was at the time. I believe it was around, I know it was probably less than $2. And I think I started at Bethlehem making $7 and something an hour, which was a lot of money. You know, it was, I remember my first paycheck. They used to hand your paychecks out. The foreman would hand your pay paychecks out. They weren't in envelopes or anything. And I remember looking at it and going, is this mine? This is all mine. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it, I, you know, I, my husband had handled most of the money and everything like that, but I didn't realize that I was going to be, you know, making that much money. I knew I was going to be making good money, but, um, and it's not just the money, it's the benefits and the, you know, even though I was covered under his, but he got laid off a lot and, you know, there were, there was a time when there were a lot of layoffs in at Bethlehem, but then one of the last contracts that they not the last contracts but one of the contracts that they negotiated they negotiated a no layoff clause so that put a lot of people at ease as far as you know there was a lot more stability you know towards the end but uh yeah the, you know honey described when when she went into the steel mill she described running into some of this like unpreparedness of the company and the hostility of the workers i wonder if did you encounter that when you started in the Baltimore? No, it wasn't like um, not everybody, but there were certain ones that I think resented you being there. I mean, there were ones that made comments and uh, usually things like, um, I can't believe your husband lets you work here, you know. Um, and you know where a lot of the hostility came from? It's other women on the outside, like friends of mine. And even like, even my sister, you know, I would never work in a place like that. Oh no, I would never go in there. And get, you know, my sister ended up the job much later on, probably about 15 years later. But, and I remember the first thing I said to her, I would never work in a place like, you know, but I mean, that was just not a place for a woman. This, they'd say, um, They'd say, like some of the men, when I first started, they would say, this is no place for a woman. This ain't no job for a woman. You know, you shouldn't be here. This is no job for a woman. And, and I, I said, this is no job for anybody, really, if you think about it. I mean, you know, I mean, my life is, is more valuable than yours. I mean, it's dangerous, but, you know, but there was a, um, a camaraderie and in a, in a, in a um, I don't think that the resentment and everything went so far as whether it allowed you to be harmed in any way or anything like that. Everybody still looked out for each other. And I think that as time went on, um, and you showed that you were seriously there to work, you know, that that respect came with that. But I think initially we were very much like a novelty or a big joke, you know, and, and they did, they would pull things on you, but they would do that with every new hire though, you know, like they'd send you for things that didn't, didn't exist. It was a big joke, you know, they'd send you over for, they would call it a wooden frigate. Go over to the shop and, and get some wooden frigates. And you go over there and ask for wooden frigates and they're like, 
they all start laughing and you know but I think that happens in, in you know in a lot of work environments there's the the rookie you know you get to laugh at the rookie but I mean there were some there were some uh, some comments and and some hostility but I don't think it extended to the point where they would see you get hurt or you know it was um, it was a man's world it was a man's world there were there wasn't a whole lot of room for um, for the, like you couldn't be a fluffball <laughs> you couldn't worry about your nails and you couldn't worry about your hair and that sort of thing you had to um, be willing to show them that you could get in there and you would get your hands dirty and stuff like that and you know you were willing to do the work and yeah, some people didn't want to train you you know because you had to be trained some some guys didn't want to train you but then once I did learn some of the jobs I was always real eager to train other people and like you begin to make friends like there was a guy that came in from another department who had more seniority and um, nobody really wanted to train him because he had more seniority so he would bump them out of their jobs and I trained him you know and him and I became friends but I mean you make you know I think you prove yourself and then and then you become um, you gain the respect and once you gain the respect um, once they seen that you know you weren't there to just just try to skate through or anything like that that you really were there to to do the best that you could do and, and um, I think you gained respect and it became almost like you have to understand the dangerous environment you're in you're in a situation where you could be killed it really any second I mean anything could fall from a crane or, or you know you really have to be very very careful so we were almost like as it, it gets to the point where you're almost like like policemen partners how they are you know how close they are and then or or even like in a um in a war zone in a setting where you're always looking out for each other's back you know so and that kind of um you know that kind of develops over time but in the beginning they didn't think we were gonna they didn't think we were gonna last they thought you know the work was too hard and you know what woman would want to would want to work there yeah, so I think it's it's interesting, Kathy, and, and honey, you can weigh in on, on this too. You know, one thing I think that was interesting at both the Bethlehem plant and the Sparrows Point plant was women were so scattered throughout the steel mill. You know, they were sent to a variety of different departments. And so often it seemed to me, like when you're talking about winning respect and earning respect, you sort of had to do that as an individual in a department that was mostly men. And I think one thing that was different about the Baltimore plant, because the Bethlehem plant really closed in 1998, was that the union was able to, you know, begin to become more involved with women, to bring women of steel into the plant and to sort of create a solidarity amongst women. And Kathy, I know you were very involved in that. Honey, I know that that didn't really happen at the Bethlehem plant. You were sort of trying to work with women on your own. So I wonder if, if you wanted to talk about that. Kathy, I think you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> um, a lot of women were um, in situations like that a lot of times you just tend to disconnect and you you know I didn't I had never been like really seriously involved in the union or anything like that um, I worked went you know worked came home took care of kids you know and all that sort of work come home I didn't really there wasn't a whole lot of um, that was the way I made my living and, and you know that was the end of that I didn't really get involved with the union a whole lot, um, although I knew people who were, you know, but um, they asked me, the international was was a, a big, you know, a, they, they did kind of like a big push for the women of steel, they wanted to, um, you know, they wanted to get women involved and, and get them active and participate in, in union affairs and stuff like that, so um, the, the president of our union asked me if I if I would be interested. He contacted me and said asked me if I would be interested in 
starting up the Women of Steel. The Women of Steel existed before me. It's just that with um, all of the, the changes and everything that were happening, Bethlehem Steel went bankrupt and then a new company took over. And so the Women of Steel, that particular, the original committee kind of, um, Addie Smith was the head of that. Um, that kind of like, not really, I don't know whether it didn't disassemble or anything. It just kind of disappeared, you know? And there were just people weren't um, focusing on that sort of thing because they were, talk, you know, it was more of a focus of keeping the plant open and what's going to happen with our, you know, that sort of thing. So I don't think. Um, so then they asked if I would be interested in um, in chairing the committee. And I was like, I don't even know what it's about. You know, I don't even know. I don't know anything about women to steal. So I went to, um, I went to, um, they sent me to Blacksburg, Virginia, and they have a Women of Steel training program. And it teaches you about um, the importance of leaning in and the importance of getting involved and, and why you need to be involved and that sort of thing. And then I kind of got it. You know, when I come back, I was like, okay, now I understand. I understand why it's so important um, because a lot of women do disconnect. And, uh, and there, you know, it's very important to, you need to know the information that you need to know, <laughs> you know, if like, like, like guys, a lot of guys will hang out at the bar after, after work and have a few beers and they talk and they, you know, network with each other. And, but a lot of women, they kind of like, you know, they're, they come in, they do their job and they go home because there's not a whole lot of women to interact with and stuff in, in a lot of the, in, in a lot of the areas. So. It was a good, it was very good, uh, you know, we started getting the women together and started getting them involved and started organizing different fundraising events and stuff like that. And it, it was a very good thing. It was, you know, more and more women started going to the union meetings and because, like, I never really went to the union. Why would you, you know, want to go to the union meetings when you're probably going to be one of the only women there? You know, you're going to feel a little odd. <laughs> You know, they used to say, they give you free hot dogs and they give you, you know, I'm like, eh, no, I don't think so, you know. But then after I got involved with Women of Steel, it was like, yeah, this is, you know, we need to know this information. This is important. And uh, and it was a good thing because it, it it does help when you when you realize that you're not alone, that there's other people in the same situation that you're in. You know, there's strength in numbers, they say. And it kind of gives you a little bit um, more courage to, to you know, I mean, simple things, things that you wouldn't even think about, like, like the color of the uniforms. I mean, I know it doesn't seem like a man would even think about that, but a woman with childbearing years is going to think about that. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's important not to have to wear light green all the time, you know, when you're out there working in an environment where... You understand what I'm saying? So, and that's not the sort of thing you can stand up in a room full of men and say, hey, I need this and this is why. You, you know, so, I mean, and it, and it kind of gives you the, um, but there are things that most people don't even think about. The size of your gloves. I mean, I remember some of the gloves we had were like Edward scissor hands. You know, you had like great big, or um, just small things like being able to, the, um, you know, just, it's all about networking and being able to interact with each other and, and, you know, you're not there to, you're not there, like, they say, why do you have to have your special, it's not to divide us, it's to unite us, it's that everybody gets involved. I mean, if you've got a baseball team and your third baseman is sitting on his hands, then you, you don't have, the, you know, everybody needs to get involved. and. So that's that's pretty much, you know, was the, was the whole yeah, purpose. Yeah, and I think that's that. very important. And I think that is something that the Baltimore plant had, and that you were very instrumental in helping to initiate that the Bethlehem steel mill never never got in part because it closed earlier, right? So it, the United Steel Workers Union really never got to the point where they recognized that they had to have this separate um, group for women and recruit women like yourself to help organize it. And um, like, I think Honey would tell us that at the Bethlehem plant, 
the union became much more receptive to, to women's interests and women's needs over time, but still never really created this separate group that was bringing women together to create you know, solidarity. So I think we have to wrap up here pretty soon for questions. I guess I would just ask Connie and Kathy to sort of quickly um, reflect on your time at Bethlehem Steel. Like what was meaningful and valuable to you about that experience? And like sort of as trailblazers in the workforce, what did you learn working in the steel mill that you would wanna pass on to girls and also to boys that are growing up today? I think you're both muted, so you have to unmute. Yeah. Um, and honey, that's true for you too. I'm pretty much, um, if I learned anything, I learned don't limit yourself and don't let people tell, the, tell you you can't do certain things. You know, at least try it. But you also got to know your limitations. I mean, um, I learned that, um, that there's tools available and that with your brain, you can accomplish just about anything. You really can. I mean, you may not be able to do it with might, but you can do it with your brain. And um, there's a smarter way to do things, you know, a lot of times. And you do, um, you know, don't ever, don't, don't ever be afraid to, to try, you know? And don't let somebody tell you that girls don't do that. You know, I think that you can do whatever you want. Now, I mean, you gotta have, sense of value <laughs> but um you know i i wouldn't had it any other way i i really wouldn't have i mean was it the easiest route to take no of course not but it built character it it built grit you know and made me tougher this, this world is is not an easy place to be and just exist in and it, and it toughens you up and it also uh makes you realize how to deal with adversity and how to deal with, you know, get along with people, even people that are very different than you, you know, it's, uh, it, it wasn't, I, I didn't have a boring life at all. I mean, and if you've seen the type of work that we've done, you know, I mean, you see that on, you think, oh, wow, I did that. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's a sense of pride in, in making steel and, and I, I guess people who never been involved with it wouldn't understand, but, um, you know, it, it's important. I always thought that what I done, I'm just a steel worker, right? But I had a nurse tell me one time, a, a friend of mine who was a nurse, I said, it amazes me what you do. I mean, you save people's lives. And she said, yeah, but I couldn't do what I do if you didn't do what you do. So. I guess we all have a place, you know? Yeah, honey, do you want to add anything to that? You're on mute, so you'd have to unmute yourself, honey. Okay, I don't know if honey can unmute herself. So I guess we would um, open it up to questions at this point. Ani, do you want to help moderate that or? If anyone has any questions at all for Kathy or Honey. I don't see any at the moment, but um, opened up the floor. So if anybody, you know, has a question or has their own experience that they'd like to share, go for it. You know, the, the sad thing of it is there are so many amazing stories that get left untold. You know, it really is. I mean, I'm just one steel worker of, you know, hundreds of us, like 225 of us, I think. Just yeah, to... yeah, I also think there's other really interesting differences between the Baltimore plant and the Bethlehem plant yeah. that are, like, I don't think have been investigated enough. I'm really curious about the role of the women who were working in the tin mill as inspectors. Because I know when that tin mill closed, a lot of those women went into other areas in the tin mill. And then with the consent decree, they started bidding on jobs outside of that. So that's an interesting case that wasn't there at Bethlehem 
plant where they had been working at Baltimore for a long time, maybe. They were a little older now, and now they were moving into these parts of the mill that had never seen women working there before. And I think some of them also, Kathy, would probably have been eligible for the back pay that was a part of the consent decree. It, it was very controversial. And when workers got that back pay, it actually came out to only about 600 bucks per person. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a lot of money, but it that it's just interesting to me in Baltimore because that wasn't the case at Beth, the Bethlehem Mill at all. Um, Jill, there was a question for the audience. Could you tell us a little bit about the consent decree and what that was and how it changed things? Yeah, so the consent decree really came out of the Civil Rights Act, right? If there hadn't been a civil rights movement and a civil rights act, then African-American workers at Bethlehem Steel's Lackawanna plant and Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point plant could not have brought race discrimination cases before the federal government, the EEOC. But because of the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil Rights Act, they were able to do that, to bring those cases um, before the federal government. And therefore, there was a whole number of cases coming out of those two plants, Lackawanna and Baltimore, which had many more African-American workers than the Bethlehem plant, for example, or Bethlehem Steel's Johnstown plant, for example. Um, so in order to resolve those race-based discrimination cases, the government, the union, United Steel Workers, and Bethlehem Steel and eight other steel corporations that were also facing race-based discrimination cases, all got together and negotiated this consent decree, which was a, essentially an affirmative action plan that would apply then to Bethlehem Steel and these other eight companies. I hope that answers the question. And I see um, Honey is unmuted. So honey, was there anything else um, that you wanted to add? Honey, did you have anything you wanted to like say about just sort of reflections on like what was meaningful and valuable to you about your entire experience being an early woman at Bethlehem Steel? I think You're we may be, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say, I think we're having, we're all having a few technical difficulties over here tonight. So um, if anyone has a question, uh, you know, that doesn't get answered because of some technical difficulties, feel free to I think most of you have my email address and you can always use the chat. Um, so certainly it's a big topic. I know it's a lot to cover in just an hour. Is there anything else, Jill, or anybody else that we wanted to go over? I don't see any other questions from, um, the audience here. Any final words? I just wanted to say that um, how I just want to thank everyone for for actually um, documenting, you know, because this is the sort of thing that could just go, um, you know, not only just women, you know, just women in the steel mills, but just the whole history of Bethlehem Steel. It's just, you know, I live right, right of course, I live right in the neighborhood still, and to see the mill gone and all these, you know, all these, their big uh, warehouses and stuff there now, it's kind of strange, but that, that people wouldn't know that history, you know, if it weren't for people like, you know, Baltimore Museum of Industry and that sort of thing. So I appreciate that people, you know, actually take an interest in, in take the time because it is, it is a, a real part of our our, our whole community and there's a lot of heart in that there's a lot of people that you know their husbands their fathers their grandfathers a lot of history there and I just I'm so glad that they're documented and 
taking a big interest in it. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, Kathy. It's really, really important to document the history. And I think it's also really important to recognize that Bethlehem Steel, you know, had all these different steel mills that are sort of part of the overall picture of Bethlehem Steel, but that are also very, very locally rooted. So Spiro's Point just had a huge impact on Baltimore and all of the working class communities and towns around um Sparrow's point, and and obviously the story of women in the mill is a part of that, but it's so much a part of the lives of so many people in Baltimore. And in the same way in Bethlehem, in a somewhat different way, because it's a different community, that steel mill like was so important in the lives of, of so many community members. And to sort of see that um, history not remembered or or mm-hmm. even the geography erased, I agree with you, Kathy, is, is it's disturbing, yeah. Well, um, I was wondering is, so I was, well, I guess I, I guess she can't, she's probably having a problem with her audio, but uh, I was wondering how her community has changed as far as like, since, because I know here it's totally different. I mean, even the, um, the people are different, you know, used to be everybody was, you know, steel workers or steel workers families and stuff and now you get a lot of um, you know a lot of bigger homes very I'm expensive not, homes. I'm unmuted now. honey i i'm yeah i'm unmuted now again <laughs> um can you hear me yep okay i think uh the attitude around bethlehem since it closed down has really changed into more people being very proud that girls went in and did what they did and and have have a better appreciation for the work they did because of all the interviews and shows that were put on by PBS there were lots of housewives at home who had no idea what their husbands did at work. And when they saw it and saw that women were doing that, it empowered them in a way. And I think it was a good, a good teacher to um, the younger girls coming up. And um, I, I think one of the most important things we should be doing is going to classrooms and talking about what we did and what we went through. So it, so it empowers them for whatever they want to do. But I think, I think in Bethlehem, there was great dismay when it closed and a lot of people were very angry, but I think um, that the community here has really pulled together to include an awful lot about the steel into the community. There's um, a steel worker statue. They sold bricks you could buy with um, everybody's name on it who worked and uh, put all around the base of that statue. There's a big memorial in our rose garden and I think, I think now that it's closed, more people are starting to realize what good it was for the community that wasn't there before. Yeah, I agree, honey. And I think a big difference. I mean, I think it's wonderful that the Baltimore Museum of Industry is really focusing on um, Bethlehem Steel of late. But I do think a big difference in Bethlehem is the preservation of the blast furnaces. It is, uh, you know, um, uh, creation of the National Museum of Industrial History. It's the work the Steel Workers Archives have done. Um, and I, I'm happy to see that kind of work being done in Baltimore now, too. So I, I agree with you. I agree. I agree. And I, I think um, there's a lot, of, a lot of girls who came in that I have to say were shot. 
not the kind of person you would have expected was going to take a job like that. And they themselves will tell you how it changed them to be more strengthened in, in their own uh, self-worth and within their families. I know one girl told me, I can't believe my brothers never worked at the steel, but when they first saw some of the movies about the steel, they held the big dinner in her honor and said, we can't believe you did this work. So that's like a really good story that came out of it, that her own family realized what they didn't realize when she was going through it and maybe didn't want to hear it. I don't know, but it, it, I just think a lot of attitudes here had changed. And um, I, I think we are fortunate what we have here in Bethlehem for uh, people who are trying very hard to keep the steel memory alive through a lot of different ways. And just with the archives, going to talk to to classrooms and to various groups. And there's questions afterwards that are unbelievable that people did not know about the steel who lived there, who, who lived here their whole life. And that, yeah. that always surprises me when we go to gift talks. Like they just say, oh my God, we had no idea. Open fires, that, that was all news to them. Yet it's there were just so many uh, remarks like that that people had no idea. They just knew their husbands went to work and got dirty, but they had no idea the danger. The best thing we ever did at this field is it was a really big deal. Every department took a weekend in a whole year. And you could bring your family members into your department. Uh, there were a couple departments they couldn't go into just because of the terrain and the danger. But every department could at least bring them to the site on the outside, even if they couldn't go on the inside. But I did a lot of those tours, and I cannot tell you the amount of wives that cried when they saw the BOF pour in steel and said, I, I, can't, I can't believe people have to do this. It, it was really an eye opener to the community when we did those tours. Yeah. yeah my, thank, you. thank you, honey. Yeah. You're welcome. Honey, I, um, my daughter, I brought my daughters down. Um, because they had a, they had a, they used to have tours that go through and everything like that. My daughters were in the teenage years, and and um, I was working that day, so they got a chance to see me work on the caster. And when I got home, um, they were sitting on the couch, and they said to me, "Mom, we want to talk to you. We don't want you working there anymore." And I just <laughs> laughed. I, I laughed. I said, "It'll be fine," because they got to see me in the silver suit with the hood and all that, you know. Right. right. But they were, they were I, uh, my, daughter, I brought my daughter in a couple of times. Um, I used to run tours in there for a short amount of time, filling in for somebody. And um, when he was off sick. And so when they would bring those bus tours in, I, called, I pulled her out of school like three times when she was younger and took her in. And um, as part of the tour, so she got to see pretty many good things. And um, she always said, oh, my God, I said, you'd be surprised. You're a very strong-willed person. It's, it isn't as bad as you think it is once you learn the job. And that's with any job you take and will do. And I, I think it was a good experience for her and for all the families that came in. Yeah, well, thank you so much, honey and Kathy. And I think that's like a really fantastic point that you make also about just 
women working in non-traditional jobs being a role model to their daughters, quite frankly, is that sort of a nice note to end on. I think we have to wrap it up. But I, I really want to thank both of you for participating in this and, and sharing um, your experiences. And thank you, Julia, as well, for um, sharing the, um, the archives there at Lehigh. And if any of you have questions about the outdoor exhibit that we have or the long-term exhibit that's going up, please do let me know. Thanks again for joining. And um, if you want to look on YouTube tomorrow, the, the link should be live. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.